just a heads up, this episode of 666 Shock Avenue could anger some people. So, listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, and welcome to 666 Shock Avenue, where we give you the truth. The truth as it is for the spooky season. Yes, that time of year when people don't know what is wrong with something, so we figure it's just how it is. Welcome to your Sunday night. I'm glad you chose to spend your time with me tonight. I do hope your week went well. I am feeling a little bit better, but not completely better. Now we'll see what happens. Anyway, like I said, uh, welcome to your Sunday night, and I do hope your week did go well. And hey, listen, before I start this, I just want to say that I'm not trying to bash anyone at all or make light of a policy somebody has or belief somebody has. I've heard it all, and it's, it's pretty twisted, in my opinion. So, I am going to cover the views of fundamentalists as well as not-so-fundamentalist views. I am, of course, talking about quoting directly from the Church of Satan concerning the spooky season that nobody knows what's wrong with. Everybody goes with a stereotype or a pre-programmed belief. I'm not saying those aren't important. I am just saying that sometimes you have to consider all angles of an issue in order to make a fair judgment of the situation but mostly i will be bringing you the history of halloween without any type of bias yes i'm going to be neutral and i encourage everyone to think for yourselves and don't take what they feed you if you take nothing else from this podcast or youtube or whatever you want to call it now since i made the switch just remember you do not have to accept what society says you can think for yourself so, um, but you know, every year you see it on social media, it's everything that will ruin everything else, and it's not even something all people agree on, as we will see very soon. So as I look on the interwebs for show material, I have discovered that everyone is really confused about what they're protesting against. It is hard to be neutral on certain topics such as this, for those who really know me, So, I know what my view is and what the view of others are, and it certainly borders on pure insanity as far as the misconceptions about spooky season. But why all the hatred? Why the confusion? Why is everything quote-unquote satanic when it comes to Halloween? In my opinion, and truthfully, there are far worse things in this world than being accused of being a Satanist, by the way. That's why I don't worry, I know who I am, and I don't need anyone's approval, including anyone who would suggest that perhaps I need to do something different with my life. Well, if you don't live my life, you can just uh, kindly keep your opinion to yourself, as I do not really want to hear any criticism. So, the real question is, am I a Satanist? Well, that's up for you to decide. I honestly don't care. People are going to say as they say. As a friend of mine once put it, people are going to complain about what you do anyway, so you might as well just do exactly what you want. Keep in mind, if it's not illegal or is harming anybody, feel free to do whatever you want to do. However, just remember always that what you do may or may not come with consequences. If you're okay with withstanding the penalties of those actions, you can indeed do whatever you want no matter how illegal it is, but just remember society has repercussions for things that we need to kind of try not to do. Most of it's just common sense, like if it's against societal norms, which a lot of things are that shouldn't be, but the real things that matter the most that society is against is who we should really look out for are these people that do everything against society's norms and standards and what's against common sense, and then they look like total trash, as they should, if they do something illegal. So... With that being said, um, we will be quoting from a website, uh, Focus on the Family will be quoted from. I know, don't turn it off yet, because there's an interesting, interesting, unpredictable answer that they had given concerning 
Halloween and whether or not you should celebrate it. Also, I will be quoting a flyer from a uh, interdenominational Christian uh, organization, and I will not mention the name as I do not feel like calling anybody out on this podcast and stuff, but there are a lot of strange things that they had said concerning it. Um, the media has definitely, definitely corrupted just about everything. So, from the real origins to the real meaning, let's go. This is the history of Halloween on 666 Shock Avenue. So, welcome to your Sunday and uh, all that again. And uh, I think I will... Um, kind of do something a little different here and there today. Um, anyway, so, uh, let's see here. What does Focus on the Family say about Christians celebrating Halloween? This comes from FocusOnTheFamily.com from their parenting section, an article titled, Should Christians Celebrate Halloween? And they explore some questions from a biblical standpoint, if any of us really are interested in the biblical standpoint. Here it is, though. What does Halloween mean? So, let's go back to the linguistics of the thing. So, Halloween is simply a contraction of all hollows and evening. The word itself means saints, evening, and it comes from the uh, Scottish terms for all hollows, eve, and over time, a variety of roots and word stems morphed into the modern spelling of Halloween. For those language nerds, there you go, now you know. So, is Halloween the devil's holiday? And this is something we're told quite often. But if uh, we base our answer off historical origins of Halloween, the answer is no. However, that doesn't exclude its overreaching associations with death and paganism. There is a very good reason that is associated with death and paganism. We'll get into that in a minute. So within the context of Christianity and biblical references, Satan or Lucifer's origin has little to do with Halloween. So all these uh, people who are anti-Halloween, sorry to tell you, but you have been misled. And the relationship between the devil and Halloween still exists for some reason. This reason has developed over the centuries because of the original emphasis upon death and even more sinister elements. So is Halloween a Christian holiday? The answer, in short, is no, it is not a Christian holiday, but, however, the early church held yearly celebrations for vigils for martyrs and deceased saints. Then, throughout the early Middle Ages, various figures within the Catholic Church adopted influences from Samhain, yet it is, cl it is clear to say that the modern interpretation of Halloween hardly resembles anything associated with Christianity or the Bible. This is quite true, I do agree. So, is it a sin to celebrate Halloween according to Focus on the Family, who, by the way, as we all know, is the leading source for people to believe what they choose based on what one guy says? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just don't like these TV preachers. And uh, Joel Osteen. So, is it a sin to celebrate Halloween for followers of Christ? This is off of focus on the family. Our actions and behaviors are judged according to our obedience to Christ. So, this is an interesting little deal. So, right. So, I mean, that's the whole gist of the Christians in general. That you have to base your life off of Christ to be a good person or something, I guess. I don't know. Within the context celebrating Halloween, the truth remains. We are defined by our actions and how close our heart is aligned with God's desires. And whether it is a sin for Christians to celebrate Halloween depends on how exactly you plan to celebrate. For some families, this might require more intentionally um, discussing uh, how you plan to celebrate Halloween. To me, it shouldn't be this huge discussion point anyway. But for other families, these discussions might lead to a change in your plans and it's perfectly acceptable behavior. This is, of course, according to the Focus on the Family website. And uh, what does the Bible say about Halloween? And since the Bible doesn't address Halloween, surprise, surprise, many Christians 
like in the celebration the moments where the Bible discusses witchcraft, sacrifice, and worldly behaviors, the Bible contains various teachings on how to behave and interact with the world's troubling celebrations. Then they quote some scripture, which I don't really know if I want to quote on this podcast. But basically, um, there was this uh, old practice where they would sacrifice humans and conjure spirits to tell fortunes and practice sorcery. And they say this is a basis of what Christians should not do. Yet some might ask how many are making human sacrifices or telling fortunes on Halloween. Well, hopefully none at all. So the focus on the family, they do get it. They do acknowledge that not everyone is a dirty, wicked, evil Satanist who is out to kill everybody, I guess. So the, and uh, basically, for those who know church and all that noise, uh, the New Testament expands upon how Christians should approach different linguistics and everything. So it seems like a whole uh, giant set of rules, right? I mean, it just all seems like another case of satanic panic because isn't that where it all goes to eventually, right? So what do we learn here, if anything? So I don't see any condemnation, uh, honestly, for Halloween. Concerning the linguistics and everything, it just seems like another case of satanic panic. But I have to say, though, I am shocked this article wasn't more condemning considering the source. As you know, focus on the family is quite rabid toward people slightly different than them, I do believe. There were some weird things that were a year ago or something, or years ago or whatever. But it seems like in a nutshell, it's all associations with death. And November 1st was, after all, the day of the dead, so this is what it is. To be honest with you, most churchgoers would totally condemn this podcast, and I think you know why. Because of the presence of 666, an anonymous individual on social media once told me basically that this will never make me happy and blah blah blah. And it's all a bunch of satanic panic in my opinion. I don't really care, like honestly, like if you have an opinion but wherever you go around trying to make it everybody's gospel truth, that is wrong. And, um, you know, gee. But anyway, uh, if you can't do what you want, dissociate from what's keeping you back. If someone claims God told them to tell you you're going to hell for even a scary movie, do not trust them. In the end, it's all about how you handle it. Isn't that the same for everything, though? Like, it just depends on how you handle a situation. For example, a road rage issue. You could want to basically beat somebody up for cutting you off, but if you don't do it, well, it's just a thought and it has no uh, substance and it makes no uh, difference either way. However, this next view totally shows the conflicting beliefs all Christians are supposed to be in sync with, and all. And for those who aren't church-based, the only manual is the Bible to them. They don't really have these um, <laughs> rule books. Well, I guess some places do. Anyway, I don't know. Anyway, this next source I will not mention. It's not worth it. But you'll know why shortly. Why I do not mention this. This would totally destroy an organization's accountability and it has with me i do not really ever want to attend this uh interdenominational christian ministry i won't read it for word for word because it's kind of long um and I, i'm not going to reveal the source the website none of that it's why we don't celebrate halloween at the center this is again an interdenominational christian ministry so they claim there are satanic origins and current satanic practices, and as you realize, this is one holiday, and this has not been successfully moved into Christian focus, and um, it is because of um, a conviction that we don't want to glorify Satan in any way, even innocently. Halloween is a high holiday for the Church of Satan, where there are more murders, child sacrifices, and other atrocious things that happen on this day than any other. They go on to say that real witches and other servants of Satan take this holiday seriously, and so do we in our ignoring of it. <laughs> oh god, it gets worse. As their denominational Christian ministry, 
We feel these type of issues fall into the gray areas of family and the church. Oh God, I'm going to laugh. We want you to know that we do not necessarily expect you to have the same convictions about the holiday as we do. We respect the decisions that you make as parents regarding the raising of your children. I'll believe that when I see it. Sorry. What we do at the center should always glorify the Lord. Ooh, Halloween in general is a diabolical day. So I'm gonna quit reading this piece of trash art. This piece of trash article, I swear. I said I wouldn't be biased, but you know, this is one thing in which I'm gonna have to cover in snippets and give my opinion after all, I guess. So you have an author named Linda Winwood. Maybe you've heard of this person called Mommy, Why Don't We Celebrate Halloween? And it's a story about a mother and her children discussing why they aren't allowed to go trick-or-treating and it shares a lot of traditions and where they come from. Ugh. My, oh my. So yeah, I thought I could read this whole deal. So what is wrong with this flyer? So, uh, basically, uh, we'll turn to the Church of Satan's website in a moment. Like I said, the not so fun ones come out. But first of all, I want to read you what the Church of Satan... This is quoted directly from their website, by the way. At least the important parts are going to be spoken. So, what holidays do Satan celebrate? Now, this is important to know because if this is a basis of your entire snot-slinging repertoire, if you even have that, which I swear some people live just to do that, but what, do the, what does the Church of Satan say about Halloween? Well, since Satanism uh, is a self-centered religion, which it is, the highest holiday of the year would be the Satanist's own birthday. This needs no ritual, but should be spent doing things a Satanist would enjoy. So having fun is satanic, I guess. <laughs> Especially on your birthday. Is that true? No, it's not, but some would say since so Satanism embraces nature and other holidays uh, the Satanists might choose to celebrate would be seasonal turning points marked by equinoxes and solstices. So what are these particular things? Uh, they're climaxes of each season and April 30th called Valpurgisnacht is the spring climax and the anniversary of the founding of the Church of Satan and is generally noted. However, it does mention Halloween, but check this out. So, it's the fall climax and must be celebrated as a time when one's inner self might be explored through the use of a costume, or one might recall those of importance in one's life who have died, as was done on the night in European tradition. So, let's just say um, they got it all wrong. So, like, what exactly, right, what exactly do I disagree with concerning this article? Well, let's go into detail on that, shall we? And I don't really think that I have my notes <laughs> where I need them. Uh, okay, so basically, satanic origins and current satanic practices. So, there is nowhere in the Church of Satan website that says that anyone should go out and sacrifice an animal or a virgin or anything. It just... Whatever you think a Satanist does, whatever you think a Satanist does on Halloween is not what a Satanist does on Halloween. Uh, yeah. So, this is all backwards. Uh, they should have read their history before they printed this embarrassing flyer. So, the reason it has never been successfully moved to a Christian focus, for one, a lot of people don't recognize the Catholic Church as... A part of the Christian religion. I am not here to judge that. I am just here to tell you what others think. So, if there are any Catholics out there listening and you get upset at me, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, um, but yeah, of course it has pagan roots and everything, but it has no satanic roots. So, the satanic origins and current satanic practices are false claims. Surprise, surprise. And so it is because of conviction that we don't want to glorify Satan in any way, even innocently. Well, maybe if you check the Church of Satan website, or maybe crack a Wikipedia page online, 
you'll be able to see exactly where it came from. The one true thing so far is Halloween is a high holiday for the Church of Satan. However, this next part, more murders, child sacrifices, and other atrocious things happen around this day than any other. This next part really cracks me up. Real witches and other servants of Satan take this holiday seriously. And so do we in ignoring it, basically. So, yeah, okay, so you're going to just put blinders on or put a blindfold on, whatever. You're going to close your eyes to something, and then maybe it'll go away, right? And, like, if we close our eyes, maybe the power of Christ will chase it away, and we won't have to worry about it. Give me a break. So here's uh, the deal. In their denominational Christian ministry, we feel these types of issues that fall into gray areas are family and church decisions. I cannot tell you how wrong this is for some places as they will literally interfere in parenting. I have seen it a lot and uh, it's normally cult settings that go like that. But I think that these are one of those people that would... <laughs> okay, so I think this is one thing that they're basically BSing the world about. So... Especially, we want you to know that we do not necessarily expect you to have the same convictions about this holiday as we do. Whatever. I doubt that a lot. But, oh, so intrusive, I think. We respect the decisions that you make as parents regarding the raising of your children. No, you do not. You would rather dictate to us how to, like, even act in the bedroom, I swear to God. People that come from an angle like this would want to critique bedroom manner. I'm not even going to lie. So, yeah, like, what we do at the Sarah should always glorify the Lord. Well, how is that happening if you're just quoting a bunch of weird crap that was, <laughs> there's like no basis, no truth, nothing. You're just going to sit here and do stereotypes and assumptions. And you're going to tell me that you, like, respect the decisions parents make in raising the children. Oh, God, I haven't laughed that much since I was a little girl. Thank you. It's so enticing to do this, I think. So, our not celebrating Halloween here at the center is based on... Oh, God, I can't read this crap much longer. Um, it's a diabolical day as a little positive input to offer our children other than free candy. Was I supposed to do something else since I was a kid with Halloween? I'm curious here. But, you know, this is, oh, God, displays in stores of blood and gore, witches and skeletons. It, maybe if they, like, really studied the history, they'd realize why they exist. Did you know that former Satanist priests have shared what Halloween meant to them? Now, that part is actually true. As a matter of fact, if you look on YouTube, you will see what the uh, former Satanist priests have shared. But, to be honest with you, I don't really know... How much of that that I honestly believe? I mean, focus on the family, the most holy institution on God's green earth. They weren't against Halloween. So what's the deal with this? And, you know, it's... Don't believe everything you see on YouTube, kids. Except for this podcast. There are real witches and warlocks that engage in real human and animal sacrificing. No, there is not. And I can totally prove this. With a quote from Mr. LeVay himself, I can definitely prove this. Which we'll get into later. The following are some thoughts about October 31st for your consideration. This is according to them. For 2,000 years, okay, the devil has been actively invading and inflicting our infiltrating our holidays, or they put in quotes, holy days in parentheses, in quotes, like it's uh, some kind of catchphrase or something like that. And he's been quite successful. Well, I guess he has, hasn't he? But I don't think that... You know what you're talking about. It's time for Christians to examine all our holiday celebrations. Well, you know what? Maybe it is because there's probably a lot of things you don't know about your own holidays that I've found through research. So, you know what? Sure. You should really go and, like, explore, like... You should examine all your holiday celebrations according to these people. What are they going to do? Cut out Christmas next because it's a pagan deal? Uh, with some of the things we do that we didn't know was pagan. I mean, seriously, come on. Like I told you, you're going to get the truth, and if you don't like the truth, then uh, maybe you should do it next week or something. Yeah, next week. <laughs> but yeah, Linda Winwood, I don't know if I would even check out her writing, man. Why we don't celebrate Halloween. 
If you're going to rob your children of the experience of trick-or-treating, I don't know what to tell you about yourself. Other than, you know, you may want to listen less to the pulpit and more to common sense. I'm just saying. So, they say that carving faces and pumpkins and calling them jack-o'-lairs refers to a pagan tradition in which a spirit is captured and trapped forever in the pumpkin. No, that is incorrect. <laughs> incorrect! The only reason that the faces are carved in the jack-o'-lanterns is because the headless horseman was forever cursed to find his head. I think is how it goes. So it has nothing to do with trapping a soul in a jack o lantern More than likely, this stuff came from the Crusades in which Christians actually killed everybody that was not Christian. So, you tell me where that came from. A lot of Christians hate the living of pagans, and I can definitely tell you that's true for a fact. Sorry. So if you... <laughs> No, whatever you do, please, for the love of God, do not do this. If you do allow your children to go to costume parties, try dressing up only as Bible figures. <laughs> Dude, are you serious? I mean, maybe in a church setting, but in public. Have you heard of bullying? It exists. <laughs> it's Bible character. Yeah, if I see Jesus coming after me on Halloween, I'm just going to probably pray a lot. And be like, it's all true, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have a bad sense of humor, so you have to pardon me. So anyway, uh, but yeah, try dressing up as Bible figures. Then pay for their counseling and therapy when other kids bully them. Uh, so anyway, Christianity Today. Oh, let's quote them, shall we? Especially in this flyer, it gives them more credibility. <laughs> Publish an article. Now, the thing is, you can tell a lot by a, um, an organization by the crap they spew about everything that they don't know about. So, uh, anyway, but let's, you be the judge for yourself on this. Christianity Today published an article that said, Celebrate Halloween is to make fun of Satan. And because this purpose makes Satan mad, it's okay to participate? No. Why is that? How does that even make sense? So to do this, that's where we get trunk or treat and the hell houses and all this noise. For Halloween. If that's your idea of a Halloween well spent, that is absolutely your choice. Like I said, this podcast was, or this uh, YouTube video, whatever it is, podcast on YouTube or vlog or whatever, was not put here today to, uh, to make fun or light of any policy or religious belief. Please don't get me wrong. And of course this video gets flagged or whatever, uh, I, I can guarantee you. I provide um, references to what I have said in this podcast, which they'll be in the description. But yeah, let's, let's talk about this. So, they say that uh, Satanism embraces nature. Well, that's cool and all, you know, because nature is a wonderful thing. April 30th and uh, October 31st are indeed the two that they celebrate aside from a birthday because Valpurgis knocked on April 30th is the founding of the Church of Satan, the anniversary for that. The, uh, one of the only, one of the only spot on truths that I see in this whole deal is the media is fascinated with evil and our children are exposed to it on TV and in the movies unless we expose the lie and help them make a good viewing choices. Yeah, okay, so it's kind of funny because, um, oh my. <laughs> there is like so much right and so much wrong with this. So much right and so much wrong. Because you know what? The media is fascinated with evil and our children are exposed to it on TV and in movies unless we expose the lie and help them make good viewing choices. This is stupid. Oh God, it's so stupid. How on earth? Oh, uh, there is no lie to this. The media is fascinated with evil and our children are exposed to it on TV and in movies. So let me ask you this. If there was one of my movies out, how many Christians would be protesting in the street? I would be like Ozzy Osbourne and probably protest with them or whatever. I mean, God, I'm just one of those people who stir the pot, dude. I mean, that's just me. But yeah, um, I do wonder though about why we don't celebrate Halloween, how much of it would be factual, that book, which kind of keeps, I keep thinking about it. But you know what? 
I'm going to tell you something. The media is fascinated with evil, and yet we allow them to watch these half-naked women music videos sell sex, and we're perfectly okay with watching the news, which should probably have a mature audience rating due to all the war and blood and gore and all the terrible crimes and the way that evil people basically are. And, um, you know, to make it worse, the internet is home to the most depraved individuals on the planet. You know these people, they lurk the dark web, you hear all this. So, um, you know, it's kind of funny how people who want to use this as a focal point, a vantage point, really don't understand that they watch the news and they worry about everything, you allow that to run your life, and yet you want to say what we shouldn't fear. When's the last time you really believed enough not to fear anything yourself? We send kids to schools with agendas we don't agree with and bitch about the media repeatedly. We say adult material should stay away from kids, yet we leave the internet fully accessible to them when they are alone, as well as get them telephones with cameras. Ugh, are you kidding me right now? You have no credibility with me whatsoever if you're going to be okay with everything else. But this is the stupidest, most contradicting thing I've ever seen, and there's too much of that in these in this little flyer notice thingy. So, what are you going to do? Spy on us all the time? So yeah, carving faces and pumpkins and calling them jack o refer to a pagan tradition in which a spirit is captured and trapped forever in the pumpkin. Is this true or false? False. In Ireland, this originated. People would carve demonic faces out of turnips and frighten away Jack's wandering soul. Story behind that, when Irish immigrants moved to the U.S., they began carving jack-o'-lanterns from pumpkins as they were native to the region. So where did it originate? Well, let's just say the legendary Headless Horseman had a lot to do with it, as I mentioned earlier. And he hurled pumpkins and has been scaring Americans for generations. Jack-o'-lanterns actually traced their origins back to old world traditions in countries including Ireland, England, and Scotland. And uh, I don't think they know what they are talking about, but when it comes to this, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory that they don't know what they're talking about. And if you don't believe me, fact check it. Go to Wikipedia. Go to anywhere. In fact, Google up, like, uh, where did jack-o'-lantern carving originate and prove me wrong? So if you allow your children to go to hot, uh, costume parties, try dressing up like biblical figures. Yeah, I already covered this. <laughs> oh, those weird Karens, I swear. People who are uninformed really bother me. So how can I take any of this crap seriously? So many things are wrong and so many things have been debunked. Thank God, ironically I say that right, I found a lot of things tell the true meaning. So you've seen one side that appears neutral, one side that is flaming torches and no mercy. Which I'm sure Jesus loves, right? So I can't take their flyer seriously. This is just too out there for me. It's probably as bad as... A Jim Jones truth or whatever. But, um, however, you know, you, you label the church of Satan as these evil individuals, right? Is Halloween important Satanist? So, from the Church Satan website, we see this holiday as the night when mundane folk try to reach down inside the quote unquote darkness, which for Satanists is a daily mode for existence, particularly in the U.S. Halloween is a time for celebrating monster films wearing costumes of macabre nature and evoking a thrill of fun and fear. Children of all ages can indulge in fantasies by donning costumes that allow for intense role-playing and the release of their quote-unquote demonic cores. The parts of their personalities often hidden from friends, co-workers, and families. So really, it is the one time a year where your inner darkness can come out but it has nothing to do with sacrifice does it no so there are traditions making this an occasion for recalling the dead it has been popularized as time to play with what historically were fears directed toward and were thought to be unquiet spirits of the departed and as the grand tradition question asked trick-or-treat this has become a means for fulfilling an indulgence in sweets without the need to resort to the optional coercion. 
saying this embrace this holiday and uh, what it's become, we do not feel the need to be tied to ancient practices. This night we smile on the amateur explorers of their own inner darkness, for we know that they enjoy their brief dip into the pool of the quote-unquote shadow world. We encourage their uh, fantasies, the candied indulgence, and the wide-ranging evocation of our aesthetics while tolerating some of the chintzy virgins, versions, rather, even if this is but once a year. And uh, for the rest of the time, uh, when those not of our made a tribe shake their heads and wonder at us, we can point out that they may find some understanding by examining their own All Hallows Eve doings. But we generally find it simpler just to say, think of the Adams family and you'll begin to see what we're about. So, were the Adams family out sacrificing, I don't know, goats or children or whatever, you know? Basically, in a nutshell, even in accordance with Church of Satan, this is an innocent, fun time that others have twisted into their own personal agenda. So far, I see hatred and uh, neutrality from the fundamentalist angle. Surprisingly, neutrality. And uh, so now it's time to get the history of Halloween. So what do you know about Sam Hain? Well, let's check this out. Um, where did it originate and everything? Well, for one, it's a Gaelic holiday. And um, this means that there were probably uh, roots not only in Ireland, but Scotland. Any country where they speak Gaelic or a Gaelic dialect of Italian. And, you know, this whole uh, ordeal is pretty interesting. So um, Sam Hain is a Scottish Gaelic term. And it's a uh, festival on November 1st, marking the end of the harvest season, beginning of the winter or darker half of the year. That is also the Irish language name for November. And uh, celebrations began on the evening of the 31st of October, since Celtic Day began and ended at sunset. And this is about halfway between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice. It is one of the four Gaelic seasonal festivals, along with... Um, three others, in bulk, Biltain, and uh, Le Gossa, or something like that. I probably screwed that up. And uh, historically, it was widely thought that Ireland, Scotland, and Isle of Man uh, held a similar festival called Kilang Gelf in Wales. I know I mispronounced that, sorry. Basically, it celebrated all over. And so basically, Celtic pagan origins and some Neolithic passage tombs in Ireland and Britain were aligned with the sunrise of the time of Sam Hain. So it is mentioned that the earliest, early, I, er, okay, so it is mentioned in the earliest Irish literature, thank you, for the 9th century, uh, that's associated with many important events in Irish mythology. The early literature says that Sam Hain was marked by great gatherings and feasts and was when the ancient burial mounds were opened which were seen as portals to the other world, and some of the literature also associates Samhain with bonfires and sacrifices. So that's old ideals, right? The thing again, you have to wonder something, right? Whether or not there were sacrifices, I don't know. All I know is, you have to consider the source in any situation, whether something is told to you or whether you read something. The saw on Wikipedia, by the way. So the festival was, uh not recorded in detail until the early modern era. So when cattle were brought down from the summer pastures and livestock were slaughtered, special bonfires were lit, which were deemed to have protective and cleansing powers, like uh, three of celebrations or threshold festival when a boundary between this world and the other world thin, making contact with the spirits or fairies 
more likely. More scholars uh, see them as remnants of pagan gods at Samhain. They were appeased with feelings of food and drink. And to ensure the people, the uh, livestock, survive the winter. The souls of the dead kin were also thought to revisit their homes, seeking hospitality in a place where the table was set for them during the meal. Uh, Mumming and guising were part of the festival. This is from at least early modern era, whereby people went door-to-door in costume, reciting uh, verses in exchange for food, and the costumes may have been a way of imitating and guising oneself from the uh, glossy and uh, divination was also a big part of the festival. It often involved um, nuts and apples. In the late 19th century, John Reese and uh, James Fraser suggested that it had been the Celtic New Year, but that is disputed. So in the 9th century, the Western Church endorsed the 1st of November as an All Saints Day, possibly due to the influence of Alcuin, A-L-C-U-I-N. 2nd of November later became All Souls Day. It is believed that Sam Hain and All Saints and All Souls Day influenced each other and the modern Halloween and most um, American Halloween traditions were inherited from the Irish and the Scottish immigrants. Folklorists have used the name Sam Hain to refer to Gaelic Halloween customs up to the 19th century. So, since the later 20th century, Hagen neo or Celtic neo excuse me, and Wiccans have observed Sam Hain or something based on it as a religious holiday. Pagans and Wiccans, not Satanists. Interesting, right? So we have the uh, Irish mythology, and it originally uh, was a spoken tradition, much of it eventually written down in the Middle Ages by Christian monks. The 10th century tale, The Wooing of Emer, lists Samhain as the first of four seasonal festivals of the year. The literature says it would says its peace would be declared when there are great gatherings and they held meetings, feasted, drank alcohol, held contests. That kind of sounds like the same thing nowadays, doesn't it? Where we go and we have a few drinks with friends, a few drink or whatever, and uh, do all kinds of things. But so far, I haven't seen anything about the uh, sacrificing of humans or animals. Well, there is a livestock they slaughter. I think there are a bunch of um, different religions, like... um, the Muslims, I believe, kill a camel for you. I'd even bark or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's there. And of course, back in the Old Testament times, they slaughtered animals in the temple. So uh, these gatherings are a popular setting for early Irish tales. And the tale of um, Cormac's Adventures says that the Feast of Terror was held every seventh Samhain, hosted by the High King of Ireland, during which new laws and duties were ordained and anyone who broke the laws established during this time would be banished and according to irish mythology samhain was a time when the doorways to the other world were opened and allowing supernatural beings and the souls of the dead to come into our world so kind of like a ouija board deal i guess except you open a portal another way so each year, the Fire Breather Island uh, emerges from the other world and burns down the Palace of Terror during the Samhain Festival. After lulling everyone to sleep with this music, one Samhain, the young Fionn Mac or whatever it's called, is unable to stay awake and slays Alan with a magical spear, which he has made leader of the, um, looks like Flana. In a similar tale, Samhain, one Samhain, the other world being Quilda, I believe that's how it's called. Comes out of the burial mound on um, (laughs) Stephen Amon and roasts a pig. I don't know what that is. So Fionn kills um, Tilda with a spear and he re-enters the mound. Fionn's thumb is caught between the door and the post as it shuts. As he puts his mouth to his pain, his thumb has been inside. Uh, The other world, so Fionn is bestowed with great wisdom. This may refer to gaining knowledge from the ancestors. The uh, colloquy of elders tells how three female werewolves emerge from the cave of Kurakin, I think, an otherworld portal, each Samhain, and kill livestock. So when uh, 
Cass Karak plays a harp, they take on human form. And when the Flana warrior Kith always, uh, or then slays them with the spear. I'm telling you, I can't really pronounce Irish, sorry. But uh, offering sacrifices were made in, according to the Book of Invasions, each Samhain, the people of Nemed gave two-thirds of their children, their corn, and their milk to the monstrous Fomorians. And they seem to represent harmful or, uh, let's see, what else? Destructive powers of nature, the signification of chaos, darkness, death, blight, and drought. The tribute paid by Nemed's people may represent a sacrifice offered at the beginning of winter, which the powers of darkness or blight and blight are in um, ascendant. Wow. According to the later Tzikas and Annals of the Four Masters, uh, when they were written by Christian monks, Sam May in ancient Ireland was associated with a god or idol called Crom Clark or something like that. The texts claim that a firstborn child would be sacrificed at the stone idol. Yeah, and they uh, say that King Tigernmus and three fourths of the people died while worshiping Crom Clark and Sam Hain. So, anyway, legendary king, two of the legendary kings uh, each die a threefold death on Sam Hain, which involve wounding, burying, and drowning. Or wounding, burning, and drowning, rather. And of which they are forewarned in the tale. Um, the destruction of um, Dadergus Hostel. The king also meets his death on Sam Hain after breaking his um, Aisa or something like that, which is prohibitions or taboos. He is warned of the impending doom by three undead horsemen who are messengers of Dong God and of the dead. And uh, the boyhood deeds of Fionn tell how each Samhain, the men of Ireland who won a beautiful maiden who lives in the fairy mound of Bridiel of uh, Krogan Hill, uh, it says that each year someone would be killed to mark the occasion uh, by persons unknown. And some academics suggest that uh, these tales recall human sacrifice and argue that several ancient Irish bogbys, such as Okrognama appear to have been kings and have been ritually killed, some of them around the time of Samhain. So in the Adventures of Nera, the king sets his, uh, his retinue of a test of bravery on Samhain night. He offers a prize wherever he can make it to the gallows and tie a band around the hangman's neck. So each challenger is thwarted by demons and runs back to the king's hall of fear. However, Nera succeeds. And the dead man then asks for a drink. So Nero carries him on his back and they stop at three houses. They are the third where the dead man drinks and spits on the householders, killing them. Returning Nero, he sees a fairy host burning at the king's hall and slaughtering those inside. He follows the host inside the portal to the other world and Nero learns that he saw a vision of what will happen the next campaign unless something is done. He is able to return to the hall and warns the king in the killing of Gnomak Fedwig or something like that. Fedeg or something like that. Tells how Mongfing kills her brother, King Krimthun of Munster, so that uh, one of her sons might become king. So she offers uh, him a poison drink at the feast, and uh, but he asks her to drink from it first. Having no other choice but to drink the poison, she dies on Samhain Eve. So the middle Irish writer notes that uh, Samhain is also called the Festival of Morgfin or Morgfin, which means the women and the uh, rabble make petitions to her at Samhain. So uh, many other events in Irish mythology happen to begin on Samhain. Invitation to Ulster that makes up for the main character. And the cattle raid of Cooley begins on Samhain, as the cattle raiding typically was a summer activity. The invasion during the off-season surprised the Ulster men. The second book of Mag, of Mag Tered also begins on Samhain. The Morgan and the Dagda meet and have sex before the battle against the 
Venorians. In this way, the Morrigan acts as a sovereignty figure and gives the victory to Dagda's people. God, I can't read that. The Ata uh, de Daman and in Asninga, um, or the dream of Aningus, is, um, it is when he and his bride-to-be switch from bird to human form, and in, um, Tomak, um, or, or the wooing of Etain, um, basically is the day which Aningus claims the kingship of Brunabona, or something like that. I can't read Irish to save my life. <coughs> so, I mean, those are the origins that are kind of in place for that, according to some Celtic literature. And this ends uh, with before historic customs, of course. Hutton suggests Sam Hain may not have been particularly associated with Supernatural, but he says that gatherings of royalty and warriors on Sam Hain may simply have been an ideal setting for such tales in the same way that many of um, um, Arthurian tales are set in the courtly gatherings at Christmas or Pentecost. So what are exactly these historic customs of Samhain? We already heard about the uh, singing door door for food and all that, but what else is going on? Well, the historic customs are basically, um, there were these um, gatherings that would happen, right? It is said the festival of Uled at Samhain lasted a week. Samhain itself was three days before and after. It involved great gatherings at which they held meetings, feasts, and drank alcohol and held contests. And the, um, Dilgoyle the Nod the Derga notes that bonfires were lit at Samhain. Stones were cast into the fires. It is mentioned that Jeffrey Keating's, um, for us, face our Elrin, my God, which is written in the early 1600s but draws on earlier medieval sources, some of which are unknown. He claims that the um, Vice of Terror was held for a week upon every third Samhain, in which nobles and nobles of Ireland met to lay down and renew the laws and to feast. And he also claims that the Druids lit a sacred bonfire at Tlaka to make sacrifices to the gods, sometimes by burning bodies. And uh, he adds that all the other fires were doused and relit before the bonfire. So these uh, Druid individuals. And you know, some of these uh, ancient ceremonies kind of do lead to origins in human sacrifice, but you know, the thing is, I mean, like, there are a lot of things in history that happen that are terrible. But the thing is, you don't necessarily have to cut out the entire uh, knowledge that the event exists. And, you know, I mean, it's a harmless deal. But, anyway. <laughs> I guess I didn't get enough to drink today. So we lived on hilltops in Sam Hain, and there were these rituals involving them. By the early modern era, they were most common in parts of the Scottish Highlands on the Isle of Man in North and Mid Wales, and in parts of Ulster. Very many now said they were formerly uh, need fires, but this custom died out. So likewise, only certain kinds of woods were traditionally used, but later records show that many kinds of flammable material were burnt, and um, it suggested that the fires were a kind of imitative or sympathetic magic, mimicking the sun, helping the powers of growth, and uh, holding back the decay and darkness of winter. They may also have served to symbolically burn up and destroy all harmful influences. Accounts from the 18th and 19th centuries suggest that fire, smoke, and ashes were deemed to have protective and cleansing powers. In the 19th century, the Moray boys asked for bonfire fuel from each house in the village. When the fire was lit, and um, one after another, the youths laid themselves down on the ground near the fire as possible as not to be burned, and in such a position as to let all the smoke roll over him, the others ran through the smoke and jumped over him. When the bonfire burnt down, they scattered the ashes, vying with each other who should scatter the most. In some areas, two bonfires would be built side by side, and the people sometimes with their livestock would walk between them as a cleansing ritual. The bones of the slaughtered cattle were said to have been cast upon the bonfire. So people also took the flames from the bonfire back to their homes. During the 19th century, in parts of Scotland, torches of burning fear or turf were carried around homes and fields to protect them. In other places, people doused their hearth fires on Samhain night 
and each person then slowly relit the hearth from the communal bonfires, thus bonding the uh, community together. 17th century writer Geoffrey Keating claimed that this was an ancient tradition instituted by the Druids. Druids, a dousing the old fire and bringing in the new may have been a way of banishing evil as part of the New Year festivals in many countries. So we hear about divination and uh, what exactly was that all about because that sounds to most people like some, ooh, some evil, terrible, satanic thing. But it was quite the opposite really. So um, the bonfires that they used were used in divination. In 18th century, a ring of stones, one for each person, was laid around a fire, perhaps on a layer of ash. Everyone ran around with a torch exulting in the morning the stones were examined and if they were any mislaid then it was said that the person it represented would not live out the year so a similar custom was observed in north wales and in Brittany. and uh james fraser suggested that this may come from a quote-unquote older custom of actually burning them an example is human sacrifice, and it may have always been symbolic. Divinations has likely been a part of the festival since ancient times. It has survived in some rural areas. So, uh, let's see. At household festivals throughout the Gaelic region of Wales, there were more rituals intended to divine the future of those gathered, especially with regard to death and marriage. And the apples and hazelnuts were often used in these divination rituals and games. So in Celtic mythology, apples were strongly associated with the other world and immortality, while hazelnuts were associated with divine wisdom. So one of the most common games was apple bobbing. You might recognize this. And uh, another involved hanging a small wooden rod from the ceiling at head height with a lit candle on one end and an apple hanging from the other. This is different, I guess. The rod was spun around and each person took turns trying to catch the apple with their teeth. Apples were peeled in one long strip and the peel tossed over the shoulder in this, and uh, its shape was said to form the first letter of the future spouse's name. Kind of interesting. Two hazelnuts were roasted near a fire, one named for the person roasted them, the other for the person they desired. If the nuts jumped away from the heat, it was a bad sign, and if the nuts roasted quietly, it foretold a good match. Items were hidden in food, usually cake, and portions of it served at random. A person's future was foretold by the item that they happened to find. For example, a ring meant a miscarriage, and a coin meant wealth, and a salty oatmeal bannock was baked. The person ate it in three bites and then went to bed in silence without anything to drink. This was said to result in a dream in which the future spouse offers them a drink to quench their thirst. Egg whites were dropped in water and the sheets foretold the number of future children. Young people would also chase crows and divine some of these things with a number of birds or the direction they flew. So what about the spirits and souls of Samhain? So it was seen as a uh, geminal time when the boundary between the world and the other world could more easily be crossed. And this meant 
the uh, Gossi, the spirits or fairies, could more easily come into our world. And many scholars uh, saw the the spirits and fairies as remnants of pagan gods and nature spirits. Let's see here. Samhain is believed that the spirits and fairies were uh, needing to be propitiated to ensure that the people and their livestock would survive the winter. Offerings of food and goods would be left outside for them, and the portions of crops might be left in the ground for them. One custom, described as a blatant example of a pagan rite surviving the Christian epoch, was recorded uh, in the 17th century. On the night of the 31st of October, fishermen and their families would go down to the shore, and one man would uh, wade into the water up to his waist, where he would pour out a cup and ask the uh, uh, Shoni, when he, uh, whom he called the god of the sea, and to bestow them with a good catch. The custom was ended in the 1670s after a campaign by the ministers, but the ceremony shifted to the springtime and survived till the early 19th century, or till the early 19th century, rather. People also took special care not to offend them and uh, sought to ward off any who were out to cause mischief. They stayed near the home or if forced to walk in the darkness, turned their clothing inside out and carried iron or salt to keep them at bay. So in Southern Ireland, it was customary on Samhain to weave a small cross of sticks and straw called a parshell or a parshell. And uh, it was similar to um, the God's Eye, uh, which is a certain kind of cross. It was fixed over the doorway to ward off bad luck, sickness, and witchcraft, and would be replaced each Samhain. So it's stamped there all year, I guess. Um, the dead were also honored at Samhain. The beginning of winter may have been seen at the most fitting time to do so. It was a time of dying in nature, and the souls of the dead were thought to revisit the home seeking hospitality, places at the dinner table, so on and so forth, as we said earlier. And uh, it was perhaps a natural thought that the approach of winter should drive the poor, shivering, hungry ghosts from the bare fields and the leafless woodlands to the... Uh, shelter of the cottage however the souls of the thankful kin could return to bestow blessings just as easily as that of a wrong person could return to wreak revenge <clears throat> so what does this deal with uh mumming and guising what are they exactly right well let's find out its origins right so it's first recorded in 16th century scotland and later in parts of ireland and in wales so ugh, People went from house to house in costume or disguise, usually reciting songs or verses in exchange for food. Remember that? Basically, uh, it may have evolved from a tradition whereby people impersonated the fairies or spirits or souls of the dead and received offerings on their behalf. Impersonating these spirits or souls was also believed to protect oneself from them. S.V. Petal suggests the geysers um, are personified. The old spirits in the winter who demanded reward in exchange for good fortune. Uh, he also suggests that um, he also suggests that uh, the ancient festival, thank you, included people in masker costumes representing these spirits, and that the modern costume came from this. In Ireland, costumes were sometimes worn by those who went about before nightfall collecting uh, for a Samhain fest. In Scotland, young men went house to house with masked, veiled, painted, or blackened faces. Yeah, try it these days, I guess. Often threatening to do mischief, and if they uh, were not welcome, they would cause this mischief. This was common in the 16th century in the Scottish countryside and persisted into the 20th century. It is suggested that the blackened faces come from using another's bonfire's ashes for protection. Uh, this has been really stigmatized in society these days. Blackface has. Kind of reminds me of blackface. Or what they call it. Uh, in Ireland in the late 18th century, peasants carrying sticks went from house to house on Samhain collecting food for the feast. It was written by Charles Valancey that they demanded this in the name of say called seal asking people to lay aside the fag calf and to bring back or to bring forth the black sheep. So lay aside the fag calf, bring forth the black sheep. In parts of Southern Ireland during the 19th century, the geysers include a hobby horse known as uh, the white mare, the man covered with a white sheet and uh, carried a decorated horse skull 
And uh, this would lead a group to the youths and uh, blowing on cow horns from farm to farm. As they recited verses, some of which, quote unquote, savored strongly of uh, paganism. And the farmer was expected to donate food. By doing so, he could expect goods and fortune from the uh, muk oila. And uh, not doing so would bring misfortune. This was akin to the uh, Maraloi, or Grey Mare, rather, procession in Wales, which takes place at midwinter. In Wales, the white horse is often seen as an omen of death. Elsewhere in Europe, costumes, mumming, or hobby horses, rather, were part of other yearly festivals. However, in the Celtic-speaking regions, they were particularly appropriate to a night which the supernatural beings were said to be abroad and could easily be imitated or warded off by human wanderers. And if you look at Wikipedia, there is a uh, example of one such mask. Um, which is where this comes from, by the way. You should check it out. Check out Sam Hain on Wikipedia and you'll see all this. Um, Hutton writes, while imitating malignant spirits... While imitating malignant spirits... Come on. It is a very short step from guising to playing pranks. So, pranks began to be a big deal on this. Playing pranks at Sam Hain is recorded in Scottish Highlands as far as back as uh, 1736. It was also common in Ireland, which led to Sam Hain being nicknamed Mischief Knight. And in some parts, uh, they did call it this. So wearing costumes on Halloween spread to England in the 20th century, as did the custom of playing pranks, though there had not been mumming at other festivals. At the time of mass transatlantic Irish and Scottish immigration which popularized Halloween in North America. Halloween in Ireland and Scotland had a strong tradition of guising and pranks. Trick or tree may have come uh, from the custom of going door to door, collecting food for Samhain feasts and Samhain bonfires to offer sacrifices to the fairies and spirits. Alternatively, it may have come from the All Hollow Tide custom of collecting soul cakes. And that's needing a citation uh, on Wikipedia, it says. Uh, the traditional illumination for geysers and pranks um, abroad this night in some places were provided by turnips or mango wurzels, uh, hollowed out to act as lanterns and often carved with grotesque faces. They were set on the uh, windowsills by those who made them. The lanterns were uh, variously said to represent the spirits of supernatural beings, or were used to ward off the evil spirits. These were common in parts of Ireland and Scottish Highlands in the 19th century. They were also found in Somerset. In the uh, 20th century, they spread to other parts of Britain and became generally known as jack-o'-lanterns. What about the livestock? Sam Hain was traditionally a time to take stock of herds and food samples. Cattle were brought down to the winter pastures after six months in the higher summer pastures and uh, it was also a time to uh, choose the animals that would be slaughtered and this custom is still observed in many who farm and raise livestock so it still continues on this day it is thought some of the rituals associated with the slaughter have been transferred to other winter holidays such as saint martin's day on 11th november in ireland where an animal, usually a rooster, goose, or sheep, would be slaughtered, and some of the blood sprinkled on the threshold of the house. It was offered to St. Martin, who may have taken the place of a god or gods, and uh, it was then eaten as part of the feast. This custom was common in parts of Ireland until the 19th century, and was found in some other parts of Europe. At the New Year in the uh, Hebrides, a man dressed in cowhide and would circle the township sunwise. A bit of hide would be burnt and everyone would be, everyone would breathe in the smoke. And these customs were meant to keep away bad luck and similar customs found in other Celtic religions. So during the late 19th and 20th century, there was a Celtic revival as an upswell of interest in Samhain and other Celtic festivals. I wonder who's responsible for that. Probably all the people who uh, were told by religious people or otherwise, maybe people on the internet, that 
that they were evil and satanic and their life was terrible and they suck. So therefore, they were all going to hell because they said so, which is the norm. A lot of people have nowhere else to go, right? So, sadly, that's how we live now, right? So, uh, but there was an upswell in interest and um, Sir John Reese put forth that it was the Celtic New Year. He inferred it from the uh, contemporary folklore in Ireland and Wales, which he felt was full of Halloween customs associated with new beginnings. He visited men and found that the Manx sometimes called 31st of October New Year's Night or um, Hagong in the uh, Tamaric Empire, written in the Middle Ages, reckoned the year around four festivals at the beginning of the season and put Sam Hain at the beginning of those. However, Hutton says that the evidence for it being Celtic or Gaelic New Year's Day is flimsy. Rye's uh, theory was popularized by Sir George Fraser. There he is again. Save James George Fraser. Though at times he did acknowledge that the evidence is inconclusive. Imagine so Fraser also put forth that Sam Hain had been the pagan Celtic festival of the dead and that it had been Christianized as all saints are all souls. Since then, Samhain has been popularly seen as Celtic New Year and Ancient Festival of the Dead. The calendar of the Celtic language, for example, begins and ends in Samhain. That's interesting. So, uh, you know, uh, in the um, Britonic branch of the Celtic languages, Samhain is known as the Clans of Winter, and the Britonic Lands of Wales. Cornwall and Brittany held festivals on 31st of October, similar to this Gaelic one. In Wales, it is Clongyoff uh, in Cornwall and Untide in Clongwe. In Brittany, it's Clongwe. Okay. I cannot pronounce any of this. I'm sorry. I've butchered it all. The Manx celebrate on 31st of October in celebration of the original New Year's Eve. Traditionally, children carve turnips rather than pumpkins and carry them around the neighborhood singing traditional songs relating to Pop to So, in 609, what is all Hollow Tide about exactly? In 609, Pope Boniface IV endorsed 13th of May as a holy day, commemorating all Christian martyrs. By 800, there was evidence that churches in Ireland in England were holding a feast commemorating All Saints on the 1st of November, which therefore became All Saints Day, or as we know it more commonly, the Day of the Dead. And uh, this was apparently inspired, um, it was apparently inspired somebody, the uh, Amoa Salzburg variant, to hold a feast on this day. James Fraser suggests the date was a Celtic idea, bringing the date to Sam Hain while Ronald Hutton suggests it was a Germanic idea writing the Irish church commemorated All Saints on the 20th of April. Some manuscripts of the Irish Mordology of Tilgat and where, uh, which day to this time have a commemoration of All Saints of Europe on the 20th of April, the commemoration of All Saints of the World on the 1st of November or the Day of the Dead. It is suggested that Alcon, a member of Charlemagne's, uh, Charlemagne's court, introduced the 1st of November date as All Saints in the Frankish Empire. And at 835, the Empire officially adopted the uh, date. Uh, in the 11th century, 2nd of November became established as All Saints Day, and this created a three day observance known as All Hollow Tide. All Hallows Eve on the 31st of October, All Hallows Day on the 1st of November. In All Saints Day on the 2nd of October, it is widely believed that many of the modern secular customs of All Hallows' Eve or Halloween were influenced by the festival of Samhain. Other scholars argue that Samhain's influence has been exaggerated, and that All Hallows' Eve influenced Samhain itself. Most American Halloween traditions were brought over by the Irish and Scottish immigrants of the 19th century. Then, though... Uh, then, through American influence, uh, these Halloween traditions spread over countries by the late 20th century. So, who celebrates all this? Well, for example, 
um, the Wiccan celebrate uh, variation of Samhain. As one of their yearly Sabbaths, the Wheel of the Year, it is deemed by most Wiccans, be, most Wiccans to be the most important of the four greater uh, Sabbaths. Samhain is seen by some Wiccans as a time to celebrate the lives of those who have died and often involves paying respect to ancestors, family members, elders of the faith, friends, pets, and other loved ones who have died. In some rituals, the spirits of the dead are invited to attend the festivals. Attend the festivals. It is seen as a festival of darkness, which is balanced at the opposite point of the wheel by the spring festival of um, Beltane. Wiccans believe that Samhain. Uh, Wiccans believe that at Samhain, the veil between this world and the afterlife is at thinnest point of the whole year, making it easier to communicate with those who have left this world. Kind of seems like Ouija boards would come into play from this, right? So Halloween or Halloween, probably known as All Halloween or Hallows Eve or All Saints Day, is a celebration observed in many countries on 31st of October. The eve of the Western Christian Feast of All Saints Day, it begins the observance of All Hollow Tide, the time in the liturgical year, dedicated to remembering the dead, including St. Hollow's martyrs and all faithful departed. So there's one theory that holds that many, cel uh, many Halloween traditions were influenced by Celtic Harvest Festivals. Interesting. And uh, to be quite honest with you, I don't really see what all the deal is with this. It seems like a day to remember the deceased which we should remember often you just really have to you just have to really kind of just ask yourself like am i going to believe what they say or am i going to think for myself on some things i'm not saying that you should like you know really really uh i'm going to include a link in the bottom for this by the way so you can check this out but you know the thing is in a nutshell it was like Everything is just so evil and satanic and weird and wrong and all these freaks come out. But to be honest with you, I don't really see this whole thing as satanic or evil. I see it as a way, nothing more, for kids to have a lot of fun. And when they do have a lot of fun, that means that everybody wins. It's a time for free candy, not a time to offer virgin sacrifices to whatever may be dwelling down below. Some people don't even know. So. But you know, you have to choose your battles. So part of it is any church that downs Halloween yet holds a trunk or treat is probably not a very credible source to get all your information about the afterlife from. Any church that condemns Halloween yet participates in trunk or treat and thinks that's absolutely fine should not be taken seriously in my opinion. Also, churches that try to tell you how to raise your family when it's really none of their business how you raise your family. Uh, that's another example of when you should not listen to these holier-than-thou people in most cases. Now, uh, I know a lot of you are thinking, well, you know, like, you know, it is satanic and blah, blah, blah. And my church told me this and my church told me that. If your church is telling you not to have fun in life, they are not the right church for you. As long as you are not killing somebody, doing things that are illegal, like, I don't know, like very bad drugs, or like drinking and driving and murdering a family of four on a sunny day in the country. You know, whatever. I mean, as long as you're not out being a total idiot, and you just don't hurt anyone, you keep to yourself. You know, it's kind of interesting. I talked to somebody on the internet quite a lot. Known him for a while, I don't think he might. He knows who he is, but I'm not gonna mention his name. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's the one who is responsible for a lot of things that I believe, like, in life. He is very influential, and he's an all-around great guy, and uh, if anyone tells you otherwise, they don't know what they're talking about. So, I was given advice long ago that it doesn't matter what you do in life, people are always going to complain about it. So, do whatever you want to do anyway. And if you know that you're not hurting anyone or anything, and if it's not going to result in trouble for anybody, for heaven's sake, who cares? Who cares what you do? It's your life, and you know, you know who you are. 
nobody else can tell you who you are except you and whoever you choose to let in to shape your worldview is exactly how your worldview is going to be if you choose an overly paranoid individual to bestow their knowledge on you as well as their bigotry or maybe their false uh, false assumptions and their ill-informed their ill-informed opinion as a whole you should really not listen to that individual or rely on them for any type of relationship or life advice to put it uh, quite bluntly if someone is telling you you can't live as you wish and it's not hurting anybody I would not listen to those individuals anymore don't get me wrong I don't have a thing against church or religion I just think that some people take it way too far and I've seen it way too often and I'm tired of seeing it if you have a religion or if you have a religious belief or if you have a faith or whether you worship Buddha Jesus Christ or the boogeyman always remember if you wouldn't want someone shoving an opposite belief down your throat do not shove it down theirs it is courtesy and it's it's what's right you know you have to be courteous you have to respect others you have to totally leave well enough alone when you totally must leave well enough alone. If you can't tell the difference, do me a favor. Don't go out in public. It's probably not the best thing for you to do. Because nobody is going to like you and you're going to run into a bunch of disappointment. If you think your opinion is all that matters in this world, guess what? Uh, <laughs> nobody else is going to care. Same with me. I don't really care. You can call me a Satanist. In fact, lately I was having a conversation with a gentleman who asked me if I was a witch or a Satanist, which I told him I don't know what I believe anymore. That individual was answered like that because I knew exactly what would have happened if I said anything other than that. He was going to browbeat the living out of me, and I just really... I've been through enough of that stuff. There are people who do not understand that fantasy is fantasy and not everybody is out to get them there's um you know whether you believe there is a devil or not or a god or not that's cool that's up to you but the thing is i don't even bother sharing what i am anymore because someone always finds fault in it especially when i write horror movies which is the devil's work you know so i i pretty much got tired a long time ago of opinions and to be honest with you, if you weren't part of the foundation, don't come in trying to renovate the structure. I am doing well. I stay to myself. And uh, I do have an announcement to make uh, concerning something I've been doing for a while. I am actually pro-marijuana. And it has helped me not relapse on the bottle. I have not done opioids in over five years. Therefore, I'm clean off opioids. And before you start downing anything that you can smoke as... A relief for uh, an ailment or maybe a stress that keeps you from doing stupid things that can kill you if I'm wrong for that well that's your opinion and I've been very cautious as to whether or not to reveal this publicly on the podcast but you know opinions are what they are and I'm tired of hiding exactly what I am in private I never tried to hide anything I just knew that people would never ever understand and let me tell you it's been a much better life and a much better world for me ever since i got the relief that i needed without harmful prescription drugs or a big pharma doing a recall or anything now i i know that there's gonna be all kinds of opinions but to be honest with you i don't care because this is my life it's not yours if i want to sit all day indoors and have my own little world before me not even go outside or bother a soul i mean what is it to you or anyone else what i do and so with all that being said that was the pre-halloween special for 666 shock avenue i really really hope that you did enjoy this podcast that you're a little bit more schooled now the link to the wikipedia will be below in the description please comment like subscribe share email realm of nightmares at mail.com Patreon Adventures and Sandy buy me a coffee at SJ42 Pro and soon I might even have a listener line back up and running where you can call, text, leave a message, get in touch with the show. 
Uh, the number that's currently on 666 Shock Avenue's page on Facebook is incorrect. That will be taken off very soon. And um, stuff because I don't need a number I'm not registered with being called that I gave out on the internet. That's not nice. <laughs> but yeah, I hope that whatever you decide to do this Halloween, that you do not be invasive, stick your nose in other people's lives, or tell them they are going to hell. And I got a little tip for the Christians out there that maybe listen to this, maybe don't. Probably closet listeners, because God forbid I listen to anything with 666, which by the way is not the mark of the beast, it's the mark of man. So, you know, good luck on that. If you read your Bible, you'd know that. But anyway, with all that being said, that is the show. Please be careful this Halloween. Don't do anything stupid. Don't tell others how to live their life if only you disagree with them. And also, Satanists no longer... And uh, Satanists do not endorse the ancient rituals, nor do they endorse anything else that they're being said they endorse. Please, for the love of all that is sacred or unsacred, stop what you're doing and leave folks alone. Or... If I catch you doing it, I'm going to tell you how you should live if I catch you. You won't like that because my opinion will obviously be too satanic and unstable. I mean, bipolar people have, like, the worst unstable personalities, right? Yeah, they're at this crap, man. I'm not even going to bother with it. So if you want to call me a Satanist, hate me, whatever, hey, that's cool and everything. I'm sure Jesus enjoys whenever you do that, right? If he tells you to do it, Here's a little tip for you. I don't think Jesus told you to tell anyone they're going to hell. Just my opinion. I know this was a long episode. I appreciate it. And uh, sub, uh, give the thumbs up, uh, subscribe, you know, of course. Ring the bell, get notified. And we'll see you this Halloween for a very special episode of 666 Shock Avenue. Take care, everybody, and happy Halloween.